Hello, chess fans. Welcome to another edition of Chess Chat, a program designed to give you, the viewer, a deeper understanding and appreciation of the wonderful and captivating world of chess. I am your host, George Merijanian, Program Director for the Watcher the Chess Club. This club meets every Wednesday, for, every Wednesday evening from 7 to 11 in room C199 of the McKay Campus School at Fitchburg State College. And with me once again is my regular co-host, trusty co-host, Martin Lane of Lunenburg, one of the top chess players in North Central Massachusetts. Welcome back, Marty. Well, good evening, George. It's good to be back. Nice to see you again. Well, I missed you last time. I, you know, you were busy, you know, with the school right. school work. Right. And again, you had a very able substitute in Paul Giovino Lunenburg. I think he did an admirable job in sure. substituting. Well, today, Marty, I thought we would honor a very famous actor. Uh, who was an avid chess player. He died 50 years ago, but his passion for chess was intense. Uh, he, he loved, he, chess was part of his, his life. And this actor was Humphrey Bogart. Now Humphrey Bogart was born in New York City on January 23rd, 1899. Uh, uh, the son of a noted Manhattan surgeon, his mother was a popular illustrator, and you know, it's interesting, the Warner Brothers publicity changed his birth date from January 23rd, 1899 to December 25th, 1899. Though Lauren Bacall, his, his uh, third wife, I guess it was, still claims that December 25th was his correct date. She, she claims she, that. She, does, she continues to claim that. But, okay. Well, but it's, an issue, it's, a, it's a con one of the many controversies. It is a controversy, right, exactly. Now, we think from the writings, the biographers, that he actually, the Bogart learned chess around the age of 13. Right, 12 or 13, this, uh, apparently on a summer vacation at the family cottage, his father taught Right, up, in upstate New York. Right. Right. And actually, so that's where he learned chess, at the, at the summer cottage. Uh, and actually, when he came back to New York City, his home, he started visiting the various chess clubs in, in New York. Right, which means he got the chess bug early, as yes, we say. Yes, a young teenager. Right. And of course, some of the clubs he must have visited were the, the two premier chess clubs in, in New York, which were the Marshall Chess Club, which is down in the Greenwich Village, right. and then the Manhattan Chess Club, which unfortunately is now defunct. Right, and who would have been the top players at that time that he might have seen? Oh, back then he probably seen uh, Al Horowitz, Isaac Marshall, Cash, maybe? Marsh, Frank Marshall, right. Isaac Cash, Dan. These, these were the top players in the country. Right. He must have actually played them and uh, knew them well. So he, uh, he, he, you know, he, he visited these clubs, and let me read from some notes because I can't remember everything about him. Right. I wanted to point out, for example, that uh, after attending these, you know, he attended these clubs, but his father sent him off to Phillips Academy right. in Andover. Here in Massachusetts. Right, here right in Massachusetts. And actually, uh, he was expelled from that school. Right. Why well, do you think he was expelled from that well, school? Well, we don't know. I mean, that's another part of the story. He either expelled or, was with, or withdrew before he got expelled, one or the other. Right. And he seems to have gotten into some trouble. His academics probably weren't very good, so well, it'd be interesting, there's a actually, lot of different stories about that. It I would guess. be interesting if they're in the archives of Phillips right. Academy, there are actually documentation to show why he was expelled from right. the school. I'm sure that's some, maybe at somewhere. At some point, yeah. Yeah, right, at some point. Okay, now, that was actually, uh, it, yeah, again, that was probably 1940, before he, en he enlisted in the Navy. Right. He enlisted in the U.S. Naval Reserve in 1918. He was right. called to active service. But the war was actually close right. to World an end. World War One was tr pretty much just ending. Right. right, and he was discharged from the Navy in 1919, and he came back home, and, and there's no work. He has no work. Right, you know, he's coming back actually as a, a, a discharged Navy veteran. And he was trying to be, get a start a career as an actor, I think. Right. Uh, yeah. But you know, but he still continued to play chess. Sure. He never forgot chess, and actually, and he, he approached a friend of the family for employment, and he got a, he got himself a job as an office boy at a theater. Uh, and then in 1920, he turned to acting. You know, he said, enough of this being office boy and running after, you know, bringing, delivering coffee right. and other things. He said, I want to be an actor. So he studied acting and uh, he turned to acting and he made his acting debut on Broadway in 1922, January 1922, in a melodrama titled Drifting. That was the name of it, Drifting. Right. And uh, it was interesting, the very acerbic newspaper theater critic, Alexander Wolcott, reviewed this for the New York Times, 
And, he, and, and this is what he said about Brando in, in his acting debut. He says, the young man is what is usually and mercifully known as inadequate. He, this was devastating. Right. You know, this is, you know, Wolcott ripped him apart as far as his acting debut. Right. So he continued to get minor roles on Broadway, but of course this wasn't working out for him at all. And so then, then the depression came along and he was pretty much out of work. Exactly. You know what ha happened? After the stock market crash in 1929, he turned to hustling, playing chess, at chess. Right. He hustled for quarters in New York City parks, including, no doubt, Washington Square, Square Park, Park, down in Greenwich Village. Made I had, famous in the movie uh, in Searching for Bobby Fischer. People that's, that, was, of that. Yeah, that was the scene right. uh, 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 that movie. He also hustled for dimes, you know, at Coney, at Coney Island. 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 Yeah. So he was a hustler. Now, I mean, do people still hustle chess? You can find that at Harvard Square, Washington Square Park in New York. Exactly. In Washington, D.C., like, was it Lafayette Square? Lafayette Square, right, right. exactly. Yeah. So he did that. He hustled and hustled. And, and then, he actually, in, in 1930, a year after the crash, he said, you know, this is not working out for me, you know, hustling, you know, right. for quarters and dimes. So he went to Hollywood hoping to find his, you know, f fame and fortune, you know, becoming an actor. But he couldn't find a job, couldn't find right. a job in Hollywood. Right. And, uh, and what he did, he actually, uh, he returned to New York the following year, 1931, he returned to New York and started hustling again. Right. Hustling actually in the windows of arcades. You right. know? And he took on all comers, yeah. So this is rather interesting. And actually, it was, it, actually it was, it, it's been established that he did play, people saw him play chess in Times Square in 1933. Yeah. So there's documentation on that. Okay, now, it wasn't until 1935 that actually he really hit it big. Uh, there was this play on Broadway called The, the Petrified right Forest. forest right. He was cast as a gangster, and this became a big hit. Right. That was his break. That was his, his break. break and this break on Broadway gave him the opening to roles in Hollywood. Hollywood right. said, hey, this guy can act after all. Right. So he goes back to Hollywood and starts appearing in a, a number of films actually in the late 30s in which he's typecast as a gangster. Right. Things like, uh, what, High Sierra, Kid Galahad, yeah. you know. Uh, the, he was, but he was typecast. Yeah, but he kept up his chess activity at the same time. Didn't he get involved in California chess? At about yes, he time? did. He got involved actually with the, uh, the, the California Chess Association, a federation. He was also involved with the U United States Chess. In fact, the United States Chess Federation was founded in 1939. Right. And actually, uh, uh, Bogart became a director, became actually a member, member of the Federation, but right. was involved actually, I think he served actually on boards of directors of right. chess. So he was actually involved as an organizer as well as a player. Now, probably his most famous film was actually Casablanca. Blanca, right. Okay, and that actually was filmed actually in 1942. Right. And that was filmed actually in uh, the, uh, where was that film? That was actually, well, wherever it was filmed, he, he, he appeared, he starred with Ingrid Bergman. Right. And there are chess playing scenes in that. In fact, here's one that's right yeah, in the monitor. Peter Lorre. Peter Lorre is looking on, you know, you know, bug eyed Peter Lorre is looking on, uh, on uh, Bogart. Uh, and it's interesting to note that these chess playing scenes were not in the original screenplay. Right. In fact, the ideas for these chess playing scenes came from uh, Bogart, Bogart himself. himself. He wanted the character to be cast a certain way. He wanted right. a drunken chess player. Exactly. Yeah. So he, he, uh, he insisted on that and they incorporated it into the film. Right. And, and of course that film did win the, the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1943. Right. Okay. And then actually he, uh, the previous year he actually played, he played actually a detective in the Maltese Falcon, right. which also was an award winning film too. Yeah. Actually, uh, there is another film he played in, uh, the, the um, African Queen. Queen. Now, the African Queen was filmed actually in the Belgian Congo. Congo. Actually, it was a 1951 was filmed. Uh, the Congo was still under the, it was a Belgian colony. Actually, nine years later, it was going, it was going to get its independence. Uh, and, uh, but in 1951, he and the, and the movie crew traveled to the Congo. Right, which was a big step in those days, to take the yes. whole crew into a place as primitive then as the Belgian Congo was. And to go on site right. you know, and, you know, and, and deal with the conditions. Right. Remember, the Congo, sure. th this place is on, on the equator. You can right. imagine the heat you know, yeah. uh, that they had to endure. So anyways, while he was actually uh, you know, in, in the Congo, and by the way, during these movies he, he played it. He would play between Casa takes. Casablanca, yeah. Maltese Falcon, you know, he would play chess right. in between takes. Right. And he had the opportunity uh, 
in, in the Congo, it was in Stanleyville, you know, right. then, then it was known as Stan Stanleyville. Now I think uh, it's called Kinshasa. Kinshasa, yeah. No, no, actually it's no, not called no, Kinshasa. No, actually, no. I found out actually the place actually is actually, uh, if I can find it here, is actually, if you give me time, what? it's called Kisangani. Kisangani. Yeah, okay. Kisangani is, okay. it's a northeast, right. uh, okay. now which is known as Zion. All right, but it was Stanleyville in those days. Stanleyville, okay. Anyways, he plays... Uh, an offhand game with a Dr. Paul Limbos, and you did right. some research on yeah, this Dr. Was, Paul Limbos. Dr. Paul Limbos was a, was a Belgian yes. physician, and he was in the Congo working for an organization known as the Institute for Tropical Medicine, which was founded in 1906 and is still in existence. Yes. It uh, has several clinics around the world in tropical areas, and it's dedicated, first of all, to researching tropical diseases and then also providing health care to people in those regions. And this Dr. Limbos was at that time, at the time of the filming, 1951, was in the Congo working there in Stanleyville at their clinic there. And so somehow, certainly, uh, it was well known that Bogart was always looking for a game with good players, and so they must have um, been brought together at some point. And so they played this game. Now, Dr. Limbos, as it turns out, was quite an accomplished player. Uh, I wasn't able to find out too much about him, but I did find out, for instance, that in 1956 and in 1962 he played on the Belgian national team in the Chess Olympiads, 1956 in Melbourne, Australia, and in 1962 in Varna, Bulgaria. In the 1962 Olympiad, uh, Limbos played third board for the Belgian national team. He had two wins, nine losses, and uh, nine draws, and five losses. And one of his losses was to Boris Spassky, who a few years later would become world champion. And so he, this, so this was an offhand game, and Paul Limbos, even though he wasn't a top-ranked world player, was certainly a, a player, an accomplished player, and we can, we'll see from the game, he was quite skilled at it. Well, let's present that game, because sure. I think this is an interesting game for our viewers to see. Uh, and the, so, so who Limbos, had, what, Limbos so who, is white, Bogart uh, is Bogart black. Is black. Okay, for, so Lim, how did the game start? Limbos opens. Uh, e2, pawn on e2 to e4. So first move is e4 for Dr. Limbos. Right, a standard and opening as we've seen it. It uh, puts a pawn in the center. Okay. Uh, it attacks these two squares which are key. All right. And uh, we've, we've discussed that many times. Yes, we have. All right, there are a number of replies for black. e5 is a very popular one, but what Bogart played was e6. Second, first move for black, e6. Right. Okay. Now how did, how did uh, Dr. Limbos... Limbos uh, replies, uh, pawn on d2 to d4. Second move, uh, d4. Again, taking the center. We've talked the importance of controlling the center. These two pawns now uh, attack these four squares right along uh, Black's front there. Now, is it, a, is it, as a rule, is it good if your opponent gives you a chance to put two pawns in the center to do it? Uh, in general, yes. Um, again, they control key squares. Uh, yes. Open up lines for the bishops now yes. have open diagonals. The queen has an open diagonal. They're well positioned in the center. If they need to, they can move forward or be used to exchange. Um, yes, it's very. That's a that's an excellent uh, placement for pawns if your opponent allows you to do it. Okay. Now bogey second move plays d5. Okay, so this is the characteristic of what's called the French defense. All right, that's what um, it's called, the French defense. defense. Um, it's difficult for blacks. Um, black has to really be aware. There, there are a lot of aggressive ways to go after it. Limbos chooses a, 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 a more conservative approach. He plays what's called the exchange variation. He exchanges the e-pawn for the pawn on d5. Okay, which allows now Bogart on his third move just to uh, exchange right back. I mean, and, right. and he takes, doesn't take with the queen. queen. He takes e, takes d5, which now allows this bishop, this light squared bishop, this one on c8, now to be able to come up. Right. Before, it was blocked. Right. All right, so now it's uh, White's turn. Limbos uh, chooses to take the, uh, the knight on b1 and plays to c3. Um, developing a knight early, that's important. We want to get the knights. We want to get the minor pieces out like we've seen. It attacks this pawn, though it is protected by the queen. But it also attacks these, these squares out here. Um, All right. So it's, it's a good position. A good developing yeah, move. good developing okay. move. Okay. All right. So it's Bogart's actually fourth move now, and he plays bishop b4. Right. Now, is this a good move? Yes, it, it pins this knight. Again, the, the knight can't move because that would be exposing the king to check, and so that would not be a legal move. So it pins the, the, the knight temporarily, at least okay. as long as the king is there. Uh, Limbos uh, continues to look for developing moves. He plays 
bishop to d3. Now he could play the bishop to b5, check, yes. but that really wouldn't accomplish very much. Um, because that could be could easily blocked. Easily blocked, and you'd have to move it again. Right. So that doesn't so accomplish he does, anything. So he's, he's, so he's not going to go there. D3 is, a, is an excellent square for the bishop right. in this line. It, 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 it controls this important diagonal along here. Yeah, this is an excellent diagonal to be on. Right. You know, I've noticed, uh, especially among beginners, that they will do, you know, if they can do throw check, check yeah. throw in a check as early as possible, right. but that doesn't always work, so bishop no. B5 is a meaningless right. move. Right. All right, so now it's Bogart's move, his fifth move, and what he plays, he develops. He, he, remember, he has to right. develop these pieces. Knight F6. Fifth move for Bogart. Right. All right. And Limbos uh, also chooses to develop. He chooses to develop his knight on g1 to e2, which serves a couple of purposes. First of all, it, it gives a little extra protection to this knight so that in case black decides to exchange, he doesn't have to double his pawns. He can just replace one knight with another. George, you know. Yes. Okay. okay, so that's a good placement of the knight. Right, and he plays it to e2 so that in case um, black brings his bishop, his white squared bishop out, um, he can block it with f3. So he plays knight on g to e2. Okay, so knight g e2. So Bogart's ready to castle on his uh, sixth move. He does right. it. Six move, castling for yeah. black. And castling early is good. It gets the king to, into a safe spot allows the rook maybe to move towards the center. Uh, Limbos does the same. He castles, gets his king to the side, his rook out. Okay. All right, Bogart's move now. Seventh move coming up. What he does now is he reinforces the defense of that D-pawn, D5, and he plays C6. Okay. So. Now, uh, Limbos goes ahead and he pins, returns the pin, pins the uh, f6 knight against the queen. Right. Okay, th that's a very good move. Now here's, it's Bogart's turn, it's his uh, eighth move coming up. Now here is where he actually could have, he could have brought his bishop out, and, and he could have brought actually bishop to g4. Right. He didn't do it, he no. could have done, he got to get that bishop out, basically pinning this, at right. you know, theoretically, but what he did instead is he was concerned about this pin on the knight and he plays knight bd7. So that's his move, eighth move, right. knight bd7. The knight protects that knight on f6. And, and here we can look at the difference. They've, they've, they've both placed their knights in similar ways in answer to pins, but the difference is that Limbos has played this bishop to an important square, whereas the black bishop is, is stuck behind the, the knight and the, it, it restricts the movement of the rook. Right. And so his, his position is already a little bit more cramped. All right, so now it's a white's move. And, uh, and so he plays knight to g3. All right. Okay, so he's actually improving the, the, the position right. of that knight. Well, and if we look at his pieces, he has a bishop pointing down here. He's got the bishop here. Right. And there he's, got a, he's moved his knight more towards the king. The queen is coming out this way. So everything is pointing towards the opposing king. Okay. Well, Bogart actually finds this very uncomfortable having this uh, p pin on the knight. Uh, uh, so he, he moves his queen. Right, he wants to relieve the pin. Relieve this pin. Get, get, and develop the Develop queen. a queen. Yeah, so he plays queen c7. That's his ninth move, queen c7. Right, and moving on to the e-file wouldn't accomplish anything because white could simply move the rook over and he'd have to do move again. Exactly. So, so he puts the queen out, and that makes some sense. All right. Now Limbos starts moving more on the king side. He moves his knight to h5, attacking this knight. Ooh, now we actually have a double attack on this knight. Right. And actually, uh, if there's exchanges here, uh, uh, is not black going to be uh, left with the right. double pawns here? In, in terms of material, they would be even. There are two pieces attacking and two pieces defending. So materially, it would come out even, but it opens up a critical file to the king. All the right. pawn would be double. There'd be an open file along the E file and along the G file. The king would be very vulnerable. Sure. All right, so what Bogart did here uh, because of this double attack on the knight on f6, he plays knight captures h5. And now white on can his bring, bring out the queen to recapture. Queen takes h5, yes, that was his uh, 11th move. Now, is there a threat here? Yes, he's threatening mate with queen take the pawn on h7. Queen takes h7 is mate. Right, so Check. Bogart right. has to defend it. He has to stop that mate. Okay, so what he does, he actually, there, actually there are two ways, but this is probably a, a, a safe way, is he plays g6. 
So right. 11th move, G6 right. well, by Bowman. Well, it attacks the queen, he has to do something. Right. Well, he's going to keep the pressure up, he's going to move the queen to H6. Okay, good position. Ah, now I can see with the queen on H6, this knight cannot move. move because, cannot it's, because it's guarding the F6 square. Yeah, and if this bishop ever got to this square here, F6, it's going to be unstoppable it's checkmate an unstoppable on G7 mate. with the queen. Right. Okay, so this knight is held down here. All right, so what uh, uh, Bogart plays is F5. Right. F5 now. Okay. okay, that was his 12th move. Right, and what Limbos does is he moves his rook on F1 to E1 to take control of the open file. Right. It's a center file. Now, could he have actually played the other rook the, uh, on A1? To certainly, A1? certainly he could have. Um, I think in this situation it doesn't make a yeah. lot of difference. But usually you, you, when, you, when the rooks are connected like that, Usually the the, the king side rook gets right. actually usually occupies tries right. to get it, on the it, e file. It's a it's first. a bit of a subtle because then he still has these right. the, the other rook for these files. Exactly, that, and that's true. It's also interesting to note that bishop is still there. The, his, these rooks are connected and are free to right. move wherever they want to go, and right. he doesn't have that kind of mobility. All right, so now he, he, he has total control of this file. So this is now, here's where he, Bogart plays a weak move. He plays knight b6. Right. Knight b6. Now here we've been talking about a kingside attack where the queen is down on h6. We have a, a bishop on g5. We have right. a, a, another bishop pointing down this file. We have a rook down the center, and he moves his knight away from the right. action. So that's yeah. So actually, he should have actually been actually bringing his knight, the knight over, the knight over to f6 Six. would have been preferable. Right. It, because actually now here, he's able to threaten to come into e4, four. block the file, and also be able bring to bring a queen over, queen over. and defuse the okay. attack. But what he does, he brings the knight over to b6. Right. Not a blunder. No. It's, it's, it's a weak move, right. but it's, it's not going to uh, be, not, yeah. be fatal uh, right. now. What does Dr. Limbos do well, now? Dr. Limbos is going to prepare to double up his rooks. Not only does he want to control this file, but he's going to double up the power on this file. Okay. He's planning to bring the A rook Ooh. now to E1. He control look at he controls this file, this E file. All right. Now Bogart actually should be concerned about this uh, doubling of the rooks. And actually, what he probably should have played here, he could should have played actually the queen over to G7. Right. Force and try force to something with say the either you t you capture me or, or capture go away. Me. Right. But what he did instead. This was the, pro see this problem bishop right. that troubled him? There's only one square this can go to, right. to come out. He plays bishop d7. Right, he wants to play that so that, so that he can get bring his rook over. Order, so he can challenge white on the file with his rook, his a, rook on a, a8. But it's but really too fatal. late for that. Yeah. This is fatal. Yeah. This is gonna cost, actually this should cost him the game. Right. It pretty much does. All right, what um, happens? He plays, uh, Limbus now plays the bishop on g5 to e7. Okay, bishop e7, now 15th move. Oh, we have a double attack here. Bishop is now attacking not only the rook on f8, but it's also attacking undefended bishop right. on b4. Right. This forces, forces an exchange. exchange. So he must take. Right. He, he doesn't want to lose a piece. There's, there's no trick. Yeah. So bishop takes e7 is Bogart's reply on his 15th so move. So captures the bishop on e7, now oh. threatening mate again. Is he threatening mate in uh, more than one way? More, uh, he's threatening queen take pawn mate or queen to g7 mate. So, so there are two mating threats right. here. Okay. It, there's only one way to stop this mate threat. Right. He must actually block, you know, he must actually block he has to this. force that. The, right. And the only move that stops the checkmate is rook f7. So that's what Bogart plays actually so on a 16th move. Now Limbos is going to exchange that. He's going to take the rook on f7. Okay. And this is all forced. Right. The, the king now, capture, Bogart can't, plays. He can't just let it go No, by. no, he can't just leave and lose, right. a, lose a piece. So king takes f7. That's so what he did on the 17th the move. queen is going to take on h7, winning a critical pawn. That is a critical pawn. All right, so now the king has to move, and if the king moves down to f8, uh, He's this lose, lose that pawn. pawn. Okay, uh, so he comes up. He comes up and protects this right. pawn. So he plays king f6. But again, that's Limbos his 18th move. Yep. Moves his a, rook on a1 to e1, threatening mate again. Now where is the where is the mate threat here? Queen to e1, e7 rather. Check. This is check. Oh yes, it checkmate. is. Checkmate. The, the king has move. no place to escape. So. We the have e to protect. has to be protected. So this has to be protected. Right. And I see two different ways it can be protected. The queen could come over here. That's one way. But he played, Bogart played queen d6, protecting the e7 right. square, stopping checkmate, 
So yeah. that was his, actually his uh, 19th move. And then Dr. Limbus comes up with an interesting looking move that, that doesn't occur to you right away, but when you look at it, it certainly makes sense. He plays G4. Okay. Now, oh, so he's actually now, we, we see attacking, he's got a, now a, a, the pawn and the bishop are attacking that pawn. Right. Of course, but of course it's adequately defended by the it, bishop and the pawn. But the key is that black cannot take this pawn. Yes. It's, it's undefended. So black you're saying take, that if, he, if, if Bogart ha, 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 takes here. Then it's checkmate on it, G6. Or he would take, queen takes G6, it's mate. Right. All right there's, so there's, he can't take the pawn. All right, so that pawn is poison. Right. All right, let's put the, the pawn back. So now what uh, Bogart plays now, all right, he can't take that pawn. All right, so it's time to bring this rook into play. Right. And I think he play, now plays a weak move. What he probably should have done was probably bring the rook maybe over, over to f8 so that he could possibly play the rook up to f7 and right. attack the queen. Right. That would have been a good move, I think. But what he plays instead, he plays the rook to d8, d8, protecting the bishop on d7, which is already protected by the bishop, I mean right. the knight, I should say. So now it's a Dr. Limbos' move now. Right, so now he plays on to f4. Ooh, now is there a threat here? Well, the, the immediate threat is g5 mate. Okay, he controls the file, he controls the rank. Okay, so, so there's only one move to stop this g5 advance right. for checkmate. Bogart has to play g5. Right. So he plays g5. And Limbos has yet another pawn move, h4, and there's nothing to stop mate at this Ooh, point. Ooh, because actually we have two, the two pawns are threatened to take that pawn. Right. So actually, either pawn, any either, pawn can checkmate on. Right, right. And actually, if he takes either pawn, pawn he just the pushes. G pawn. Actually, if he takes actually, if he takes e either, either this way or the other way, this pawn advances. The G, the G pawn will be the, the doing the checkmating. And if he doesn't take, then either, either pawn can take, and it'll be checkmate. Okay. So, so uh, Bogart resigned. Right. Bogart did actually didn't <laughs> want to continue the game because he realized it's, it's an unstoppable mate. Right. Now, what do you think of this game? I, actually, I, I, I thought Bogart was doing fine I until think, he... I think he did well. I mean, I, he, I think you saw the difference between a player like Bogart, who um, had worked as a chess hustler, so a very tactical game, looking for combinations, right. against an accomplished player, somebody, this Dr. Limbos, who clearly had a lot of tournament experience, who had studied the game. Right. You know, it was, it, was, um, it was a game between two good players, but the difference between a player who has who seriously studied the game and someone who whose experience really comes from a lot of offhand games right you know uh, actually Bogart you know as I say at the beginning of the show he, he was an avid player of chess he played it all his life all his was life a, there and, was a, I and, read somewhere that he had a, um, you know that he analyzed right up that he had a chess board right next to his bed right up to the end so that he, he did was analyzing games. and actually he was interviewed uh, I think in 1945 in Silver Screen magazine very popular right. movie magazine and they asked him I said they asked him uh, is chess important to you he says yes it's one of the most important things in my life is chess yeah. and actually he and other act he and other actors actresses back actually in the late 30s during the war early war years you know, Charles Coburn, Ch Charlie Chaplin, Charles Boyer, Basil Rathbone, Frank Chantone, actresses Maureen right. O'Sullivan, Myrna Loy, Linda Darnell, they played chess. They played right. chess at, at the movie theaters. So they were avid chess players. Right. But, but Bogart was heads over, head over sure. heels with the strongest of all of well, them. Well, he, he claimed he was the strongest player in Hollywood, and he, he yes. probably was. Yes, um. so chess was a part of his life. He lived and breathed it. Uh, ever since he, he lear learned the game at the age of uh, 13. Yeah. Well, I think that's... We're down to our last minute. I think that's going to be it for today, Marty. I thank you uh, for going over this game with me. And I think uh, we have been entertained. We've learned something from this game that uh, even amateur players such as Bogart, you know, can actually enjoy the game. And I hope actually you'll join us next time uh, for ch another edition of Chess Chat in which uh, Mar Marty and I are going to present, we hope, an interesting game for your enjoyment and edification. So stay tuned for the next edition of Chess Chat coming your way.